I've been doing this course in music for almost two decades now and using uh, this technology and it was around the time of that conference just before it, I heard an item on CBC radio that somebody, one of the science profs here at Dow was using something called a clicker and the prof came on and explained what it was. Um, and I said, well, I'm dealing, I'm dealing in a class, classes over the past two decades <coughs> that range, any, started off at around 60 students and has gotten as high as 400. And I said, well, how can I, I, and I always start off my class with, has anybody seen the movie Mr. Holland's Opus? I don't, if, I don't know if you know this film. It's, it's a jazzer who does one night club dance, decides to get married. <laughs> That's the end of his one night club stands uh, because it's not going to support his child. He's got to have a child. So he has to go get a real job. And his job is teaching music at a public school. And he gets up in front of the, the band. And the first question he comes out with is this brilliant question. He says, the, the kids are sitting around, teenagers. He says, What is music? Oh, and the kids go, Oh, God, you know, what a way to start. Well, I start off the class with that way. Come on, come on, let's deal with that. What is music? Uh, it's like the old question, what is art? And when I start off, guess how many responses, no matter what the size of the class I get, guess how many responses I get? Zero. Zero. None. Zero. Zero. So how am I going to get some kind of interaction in the students? So I, when I heard this item on the radio, I said, maybe this is the answer. And actually, it hasn't, uh, it hasn't solved all that, that issue, but it does um, provide some kind of interaction. So I've decided to use it. And I've since set up my syllabus in this manner. And the, and the two points you've just talked about online quiz, I do do an online quiz. And it's based on the required text. Uh, so at the end of the term, they have uh, 10 multiple choice questions based on the text. It's up for a week. It's um, open book. Um, the interesting thing is you can you can tell when somebody does really badly whether they cheated because you get three people with identically the same bad mark. So there's a the open book can be a, a, a plus for a student, but it also be a negative if you get the wrong student you're copying from. Uh, so that I won't dwell too much on the online quiz. What I want to talk about is the class participation using CPS response pad in each of the 12 classes. Each class you use it, you can earn up to 1.67%, uh, totaling 20% of your total grade, which is a significant amount. When I started off, the technology was new to me, and I felt it was unfair. I didn't, didn't give them any points at all. I just told them that I can track your participation at the end of term, because it's a large class, if there are issues with your grade, the priority will be speaking to those students who have a high participation. I'll, I'll speak to those students first because if you've been here, you've been in class, maybe there's another issue we can deal with. Eventually, I, start, I worked it up to 10% for participation using them in the class, and now it's at 20%. Um, and now I'll show you how it works. Any questions on that? Do you understand how that is? And plus this 1.67, I split in half. The class is two and a half hours long, actually next year it will be three, but so we do a break in the middle. At the break, I split that 1.67 in half so they can earn half of it in the first half, half of it in the second half, because I've been tracking some of the students come answer the first couple of questions and split. So that has, that has uh, dealt with that issue. Anyway, that's the, the structure and how the, uh, uh, the breakdown and how I'm using it for assessments. I am not using it to test them in class. First four questions in class are on the text. So by the end of the term, they have not only had the 10 questions on the required text as part of the multiple choice, but they've had 4 times 12, 48 questions on the text. So it's covered the text pretty well. Uh, and of course, the, the 10 that they do on their own, they actually get a grade on. But let me uh, maybe show you uh, how this how this actually works. Uh, 
This is the, uh, the CPS when you have it loaded on, and it gives you your class. My class right now is 86 students, so you can see them all listed here. And you'll notice the numbers here is the number of the clicker. This is how I track their usage. If I go to, let me show you what happens when they actually, um, I'll actually engage. This is what will happen at the beginning of the class. This is a clicker, CPS response pad, and I've got a little demo class. If all goes well, I'll engage it here. And you'll get a welcome screen that says, welcome to the class. And one of the first slides I show at the beginning of the year is the clicker, and I tell them how to use it. Um, the fact that you, this is the enter key. You respond to a question by pushing a number here and press the enter key. And what happens in actual, I'll show you a, uh, here's one of the questions I start off the class with. What do you want to get out of the course? Uh, here's what last year's class came up. I've developed these based on uh, previous classes. So I click on, and, and by the way, I do not, there are no right or wrong answers in the sense that I give them a grade. There may be right or wrong answers which they will discover when I show the results on the screen, which I'll demonstrate now. So if I click on verbal and I go, you have the chance to answer A to I, and I'll go in and note these numbers along the bottom, they will see these on the screen when I, hopefully, this will uh, put in a response. So I'll do this. There. You see the number, I'm number one. I'm always number one. Um, it, it turns dark blue. That'll can, then they can, the student can confirm that they, in fact, have um, connected. Push end, and you'll get a graph on the screen. Now, normally, these would all be filled depending on what answer they gave, and you can see that I have answered I. So that's basically how it works. So the beauty of this is whatever I ask is the student gets almost instant feedback. If I had asked this question verbally, <laughs> I might have gotten three responses out of 90 students. I do use verbal questions. I really have to you know, just stand up in front of the class, walk to the front row, and literally sometimes have to say, okay, come on. You, know, you, you look like you have an answer on your mind. So it's, I, use, I still do use actual verbal questions, but this, I find, uh, uh, gives me feedback on what they're thinking and gives the student some feedback on their answer as well. Um, and what I think I'll do now is get out of this uh, because I will... Uh, want to? I want to uh, show you the questions, but I also want to show. No, no, no. I'll continue this. I'll show you some of the questions that I use. Um, my course is uh, classical music for non-music majors. So guess what? I'm getting students who this is the first time they've ever heard a classical piece of music in your life, and I'm getting students who are have had seven years of uh, U of T conservatory piano. So the, the range is quite wide. So some of the questions I ask may sound very simplistic, but on the other hand, um, I have to include everyone in the course. This is a question based on the text. And this is the kind of question I would lead off each class with. As far as the text goes, they're on, they're on their own to read the text. And the rest of the class really is not concerned with the text. It's the first four questions, but it parallels the course. It's a, it's a uh, a text written by Daniel Levitin called Your Brain on Music. He's a uh, musicologist, and he, maybe some of you know the book. He's a brilliant guy, a great communicator. Uh, he's a musicologist and a neurologist. neurologist. He's into neurology, so the combination is great. He has a lab at McGill University. So according to Levitin, Americans spend the most money on which items? Sex. Music, prescription, drugs, loaves of bread. Now, there is a right answer here. I said, it's in the book. You can find it in the book. If you read the book, you'll know the answer. Anybody know the answer? Prescription drugs. C. Equal answers, they break up. They, they crack up. <laughs> and I said, what kind of a course is this? <laughs> music. Books about music. Another type of question. And one of the things I was trying to get out from uh, the students is what kind of effect 
does some of this music have on you? Um, uh, in fact, I'll ask questions. Did you like that? Did you not like it? Were you bored? Uh, were, you, were you in ecstasy? Uh, things like that, getting emotional responses. Now, you would never get that in a direct question with a student. They're, they're completely, uh, you know, embarrassed to be among their peers and to answer. But here it's anonymous. So, I don't know if you know the music of Gustav Mahler. Mahler was a, a bipolar, manic depressive composer, and his music is extremely emotional. Uh, instantaneous emotional shifts. And I used the first movement of Mahler's second symphony. It's about 21 minutes long. They listen to the entire thing, and they're asked to check off on a piece of paper how many times they hear an emotional shift and then give a response. Well, this, I'm covering several things there. First of all, there's something on the screen. Two, there's an activity during listening to the music instead of going to sleep. And thirdly, I'm actually making a point about Mahler's music and the fact that it is extremely emotional. It's extremely popular these days for some reason because many, many, perhaps many people relate to the fact that we do have these emotional swings. Um, and every one of these responses I'll get all the way from 1 to 5 to more than 40. And I guarantee you it is more than 40 in that piece of music. So basically I'm, I'm trying to get some kind of, of my, a sense for me of what's going on with what I'm delivering to the students and also something coming back. And I want to stress the point that in this class I do not, for the most part, pay, play just um, a small, short examples. I do use short examples from time to time. But for example, in my Anton Bruckner class, they listen to the entire Bruckner 8 symphony. It is 90 minutes long. And I do have images on the screen to go along with it to engage them. I meant to point out earlier in the syllabus, they are not allowed to use any other electronic device in the class. This is the reason that I've stuck with CPS. Um, there have been many other systems that have come along that you can actually use uh, smartphones uh, or smart devices and they don't have to buy a clicker. And I almost went there. I almost went there, but then it occurred to me I have just tried to do, uh, insulate them from the rest of the world for this two and a half hours and immerse them in, some, in another experience and I don't want, and, and I don't want them, as some of I caught some of the students doing early on, watching movies while bloody music playing. So, in in essence, some of these questions, which I'll have up on the screen, keep them engaged. And you know, if they want to sit there and open their books and read uh, a text from another course while they're listening to music, I don't mind. But I don't want. Um, uh, iPhones and computer screens distracting other people who are really engaged in listening to music. Both courses I gave, listening to classical music and listening beyond the classical, listening beyond the classics stresses listening. The course is strategies on listening and how to enrich your lives uh, with the experience of classical music. Someday they, they may come back to it and it will be something that they can um, add to their, their life experience. So I'll just show you a few of the examples of the question. Uh, we listened to a first movement of Mozart, uh, uh, a G minor symphony number 40 by Mozart. Can you hear the ABA classical format, this ternary format that the classical period was so well known for, Haydn and Mozart? And merely simple question, yes, no, or not sure. Gives me feedback, and I ask this question about six times during that class on classical music, and all of a sudden you can see the the graph shifting by the end, and finally, most of the students are getting it. Um, in when I deal with romantic music, I ask, I play a piece called Symphonie Fantastique by Hector Berlioz, um, and it's about a drug trip. It's about a, a, a young uh, musician who ODs on opium, and he has this incredibly crazy dream, and it's crazy music, and premiered in, on December 5th in 1830. And I asked them to imagine, after they've heard it, um, what do you, how do you think you would have responded had you lived in 1830 to a piece like this? So they have uh, an option of scary, entertaining, engaging, and shocking. 
These are responses I could never get by asking them verbally, but I do get them. And they see the, uh, in fact, all four responses are graphed and they show up. Uh, this is the one I have a lot of fun with. According to Oliver Sacks, who's just written this ma marvelous book called Musicophilia, the great German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, for many years devo a devoted Wagnerian, split with Wagner, later spoke of Richard Wagner's music as it's amplifying the pathological in music, a degeneration of the sense of rhythm, endless melody, or the polypus of music. Which is it? Well, it turns out it's all four. He really, really <laughs> was anti-Wagner. So then the next question is, so what's a polypus? Is it a sea animal, a complex and confusing many-sided personality, a thing containing too many parts, or a disease, growth of the mucous membrane? In this one, only one answer is correct, and it's D. That's what he thought of Wagner's music. Um, and then I'll end the course, which makes sense, uh, which of the course expectations was best achieved. It's, and you can see them on the screen. They get a chance to, to tell me uh, what they thought. But I think just as importantly, they get a chance to see what their peers thought about what they got out of the course. So it's, it's very simple. Um, they do not get graded on whether they were right or wrong. Um, but here is how I'll show you uh, how this can be used. This is one of the, and I use maybe 10% of the potential of this system. And that is by generating a report. And I will generate a report, an actual report from one of the classes and show you how that works. I will delete myself so I don't show. Um, this is how I use the, uh, the results of the participation. I'll go to instructor sum summary preview, it processes the data, I will get a report of all the students who have clicked in. I don't know if you noticed earlier, it will filter out any student who has not clicked in. And then I go to output, I go to Excel, and it will give me an Excel sheet, uh, which I, I will not show you here because I'm going to have to save it, but it will generate an Excel sheet which I can then copy into but I'll show you here. Um, this is my uh, participation um, grades. That response I can get can be copied into each of, see the dates of the classes? This is the first half of the class, second half of the class, first half of the class, second half of the class. And if you scroll down, their names go in. And that can be tabulated with a formula to give them a score, which is in this column here, this, the column E for the class. So at this point, um, someone who has earned 11.69 has done very well, has participated in a lot of the classes. The black boxes, I just blanked out the IDs and stuff like that. Uh, and then down here at the bottom, I can formulate class average for participation is right now it's 9.19 and I think it's that's out of maybe 12 or 13 which would be a perfect score so it's somewhere in the 70s between the 70s and 80s for class participation it's whether or not they clicked in in the first and second half of the class I have probably anywhere between um, 10 and a dozen in a class heavily loaded in the first half of the class Less, less questions in the second half of the class, but even if there's only one question in the second half of the class, it, it uh, records that they were there, that we were actually participating in the class. The whole idea is to, um, well, it, it, it has boosted my attendance uh, considerably. Um, most of the, and they know, they know up front that if, they, if they're not there, they're not going to get credit. Uh, but it does allow me, if you look under <laughs> If, if you look at this box here, occasionally a student can have a legitimate excuse. The bookstore runs out of codes, so I'm, I give them an excuse. They have, uh, they're ill. If they get a medical excuse, I'll, I don't know if I can find one, just, but just imagine I pull it, put in medical and I excuse them from the class. They don't lose, lose participation. And occasionally I'll, I'll give them a compassionate excuse if there's a death in the immediate family, so they're not completely devastated. Um, Yes. Sorry. Do do 
Have you ever had them come in with other yep. others? Uh, um, the other clickers, and not, uh, especially when I had a class of 400, um, I had probably two cases per term, and it is considered plagiarism. Uh, they're invigilated by the TAs who will find them, TAs record their numbers, bring them to me. When I look at the report, which I'll show you in a sec, um, I can actually see that the identical uh, things were put in by the two students. I've actually uh, taken a, a couple of the students up for plagiarism charge on that with cheating. I'll never forget one class I had, the, the students the student was as far away as you are from me. I was giving a lecture. I looked down. He had three. <laughs> I mean, if push came to shove and I needed to know, I can do it by looking at a, uh, a, a different aspect of the report. And I'll show you what I mean. Uh, I'll go to the same class. OK, and I'll delete myself. Uh, by the way, uh, and I know you, you uh, are very strong on this. In order for this to work, you've got to create your own uh, separate account as a student. So you enter yourself into the class as a student, which, which you should be doing anyway when you, if you use OWL. It's the, it's the best way to see if your OWL system is set up properly. You go in as a student. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, you need it for this uh, in order to, to, I always use my clicker to make sure the system is working. Uh, so, uh, I believe it is a question report. So this will give you a report on each of the questions, and you can see how each student has answered. So if you did want to track how they answered, my problem is, in a class that large, to track every question and give them a grade for every question, I'm looking at a workload issue. Mm -hmm. There may be a way, I will get a student who will come up at the break and say, I think I missed one of the questions. Says, don't relax. It's okay. You're okay. I don't make a big deal of yeah. it. But if the student has, takes the trouble of asking me, I said, you're okay. As long as you've seen your, your response click in at least once in half the class, you're cool. Oh, so they don't know that they only have to hit it once? No. I, don't, I mean, I don't advertise it. Right. Yeah. But I tell them that I'll be measuring their responses throughout the class. Right. That's in the syllabus. It's in black and white. So if there's ever a question, I said, look, you didn't tell me I wasn't supposed to be back then. I couldn't stay, you know. In fact, I got on the, on the uh, class surveys. Uh, most of the surveys, they, they love the clickers. It's fun. It's a little, you know, it's, a, it's something to do. Uh, but I did get one response. He said, I hate that clickers. It forces me to go to class. I go to class. <laughs> yeah. uh, just one more, one more thing that I'll show you. Uh, we page down here. You'll get a graph and you'll get the various responses, which can be interesting if you're asking a, uh, a question that you would like to know how many of the students really got moved by the piece that you were doing. So question C obviously was the most, I can't remember what question it was. Uh, I can scroll back and see what it was. So C, um, definable meter and, and a pulse is the correct answer. The, 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 large, the largest proportion of students got the answer correct. There are at least, um, and, and I'll end here, there are at least, you can see all the categories of reports that you get back. If you really want to dig into it and do some um, tracking and some data analysis, there are quite a variety. Anyway, that's how I use it.